Book eight, banquet in the house of Alcinus, the games. Now, when the child of morning, rosy finger dawn, appeared, Alcinus and Odysseus both rose, and Alcinus led the way to the Phrygian place of assembly, which was near the ships. When they got there, they sat down side by side on a seat of polished stone, while Athena took the form of one of Alcinus's servants and went round the town in order to help Odysseus to get home. She went up to the citizens, man by man, and said, Elder man, and some counselors of the Phrygians, come to the assembly, all of you, and listen to the stranger who has last come off a long voyage to the house of King Alcinus. He looks like an immortal god. With these words, she made them all want to come, and they flocked to the assembly till seats and standing room were alike, crowded. Everyone was struck with the appearance of Odysseus, for Athena had beautified him about the head and shoulders, making him more taller and stouter, and he really was, that he might impress the Hercules favorably as being a very remarkable man, and might come off well in the many trials of skill to which they would challenge him. Then, when they were got together, Alcinus spoke, Hear me, said the outer man and town counselors of the Hercules, that I may speak even as I am minded. The stranger, whoever he may be, has found his way to my house from somewhere or other, either east or west. He wants an escort and wishes to have the matter settled. Let us then get one ready for him, as he we have done for others before him. Indeed, no one who ever yet came to my house has been able to complain of me for not speeding him on his way soon enough. Let us draw a ship into the sea, one that has never yet made a voyage, and man her with two or fifty of our smartest young sailors. Then when you have made fast your oars, each by his own sea, to leave the ship, and come to my house to prepare a feast, I will find you in everything. I am giving these instructions to the young men who will form the crew, for as regards the alderman and town councillors, you will join me entertaining our guests in the cloisters. I can take no excuses, and we will have Demodocus to sing to us, for there is no bard like him, whatever he may choose to sing about. I will send us in the way, and others followed after, while the servant went to fetch Demodocus, the fifty-two pitch oarsmen, went up to the seashore, as they had been told. And when they got there, they drew the ship into the water, got her mast, and sails inside her, bound the oars, the dolphins, with twisted of leather, all in due course, and the white sails aloft. They moored the vessel a little way out from the land and came on shore and went to the house of King Alcinous. The outhouses, yards, and all the precincts were filled with crowds of men, hand great multitudes, both the old and young. And Alcinous killed them a dozen sheep, eight full grown pigs, and two oxen. These they skinned and dressed so as to provide a magnificent banquet. The servant presently led in the famous bard Demodocus, whom the muse had dearly loved, but to whom she had given both good and evil. For though she had endowed him with a divine gift of song, she had robbed him of his eyesight. Pontinus set to see for him among the guests, leaning it up against a barren post. He hung the lyre for him on a peg over his head and showed him, but he was to feel for it with his hands. He also sat there at table, as he cut the tools by his side, a cup of wine from which he might drink whenever he was exposed. The company then laid their hands upon the good things that were before them, but as soon as they had enough to eat and drink from use and sire to Medocus to sing a piece of heroes, and more especially an actor that was not mouthed of all men, so basically quarrel between Odysseus and Achilles, and the fierce words that they had heaped on one another as they sat together at the banquet. But Agamemnon was glad when he heard his chieftains quarreling with one another, for Apollo had foretold from this as Pytho when he crossed the stone floor to consult the oracle. Here was the beginnings of the evil that will be the will of Zeus, but fell both on Danines and Trojans. Thus to sing the bar, but Odysseus drew his purple mantle over his head and covered his face, for he was ashamed to let the Phrygians see that he was weeping. When the bard left off singing, he wiped the tears from his eyes and covered his face, and taking his cup, made a drink offering to the gods. But when the Phrygians pressed the Demodocus to sing further, for they delighted in his lays, Odysseus again drew his mantle over his head and wept bitterly. No one noticed the distress except Halcinus, who was sitting near him and heard the heavy sighs that he was heaving. So he at once said, Our men and town counselors of the Phrygians, we have had enough now. Both of these are the men of this that is, it's due accompaniment. Let us proceed, therefore, with athletic sports, so that our guests on his return home may be able to tell his friends how much we surpass all other nations as boxers, wrestlers, jumpers, and runners. But these words he led the way, and others followed after a servant hung Demodocus's leer on his peg for him and led him out the cloister, and said, On the same way, has that along all Chief men when the Phrygians were going to see the sports. A crowd of several thousand people followed them, and there were many excellent competitors for the prizes Acronios, Acleos, Elytrius, Natrios, Priamenius, Anchilios, Eurymetilius, Pontius, Hororius, Thun, Anabianesius, and Amphilus, son of Polynius, son of Tecton. There was also Eurylalas, son of Nabulus, who was like Ares himself, and was the best looking man among the Phrygians, except Laodamas. Three sons of Alcinus, Laodamas, Helios, and Sclytinius competed also. The foot races came first, the course was set out for them from the starting post, and they raised the dust upon the plan as they flew forward at the same moment. Lightonius came in first by a long way. He left everyone else behind him by the length of the furrow, that a couple of mules can flow in the fallow field. They then turned to the painful art of racing, and here the last, proved to be the best man, and clearly less, excelled all the others in jumping while at throwing the disc. There was no one who could approach Elatrius. Alcinous' son, Laodamas, was the best officer, and it was he who was presently said when they had all been diverted with the games. Let us ask the stranger whether he excels in any of these sports. He seems very powerfully built, his eyes, calves, hands, and neck of prodigious strength, nor is he at all old, but he has suffered much lately, and there is nothing like the sea for making havoc with a man, no matter how strong he is. You are quite right, Laodamas, replied Eurylas. Go up to your guests and speak to him about it yourself. When Laodamas heard this, he made his way into the middle of the crowd and said to Odysseus, I hope, sir, that you will enter yourself for someone or other of our competitions. If you are skilled in any of them, and you must have gone in for a many of the one before now, there is nothing that does anyone so much credit all his life, long as the showing himself a proper man with his hands and feet to have a try there for as something in advantage all sorrow from, nor mind, nor return home will not be long delayed, for the ship is already drawn into the water and the crew is down. Odysseus answered, Laodamas, why do you want to talk to me in this way? My mind is said rather on cares and contest. I have been through infinite trouble, and am come among you now as a suppliant, praying to your king and people to further me on my return home. Then your loss rebelled him at rising and said, I gather then that you are unskilled in any of the many sorts, and then generally delight him. I suppose you are one of those drafting traders that go about in ships as captains or merchants who think of nothing but their outward race and homeward cargoes. There does not seem to be much of the athletes about you. For shame, sir, answered Odysseus fiercely. You are an insolent fellow, so true is it that the gods do not raise all men alike in speech, person, and understanding. One man may be of weak presence, but heaven has adorned this with such a good conversation that he charms everyone who sees him. This honey of moderation carries his hearers with him, so that he is the leader in all assemblies of his fellows. And wherever he goes, he is looked up to. Another may be as handsome as a god, but his good looks are not crowned with discretion. This is your case. No god could make a finer fellow than
earth and sorrow, but I have gone through much both on the field of battle and by the ways of the very sea. 